chap. 7, the committees, section I who may take these offices. In the case of idiots and lunatics the civil law agrees with ours, by assigning them tutors to protect their persons, and curators to manage their estates. For if a man, by notorious prodigality, was in danger of wasting his estate, he was esteemed non-compass, and committed to the care of curators or tutors, by the praetor, and, by the more ancient laws of Solon, such prodigals were branded with perpetual infamy. But with us, when a man, on an inquest of idiocy has been returned an unthrift, and not an idiot, no further proceedings have been had. The propriety of the practice seems to be very questionable, says Sir William Blackstone. It was doubtless an excellent method of benefiting the individual, and preserving estates in families, but it hardly seems calculated for the genius of a free nation, who claim and exercise the liberty of using their own property as they please. Sicutiochuo, Atalinum non ledas is the only restriction our laws have given with regard to economical prudence, and the frequent circulation and transfer of lands and other property, which cannot be effected without extravagance somewhere, are, perhaps, not a little conducive towards keeping our mixed constitution in its due health and vigour. The Lord Chancellor, rather than the Court of Chancery, after the commission is returned, usually commits the care of the lunatic, with a suitable allowance out of his estates for his maintenance, to some friend or relation, who is then called the committee, to prevent sinister practices. The care of his person is not committed to his heir at law, because it is his interest that the lunatic should die. But, it hath been said, that there lies not the same objection against his next of kin, provided he be not his heir, for it is his interest to preserve the lunatic's life, in order to increase the personal estate by savings which he or his family may hereafter be entitled to enjoy. But this rule of not appointing the next of kin entitled to the estate in remainder to be committee of the estate, has not of late years been adhered to. The distinction upon which, in the cases referred to in the margin, that rule was considered not applicable to the next of kin, from their interest in the probable increase of the personal estate during the life of the lunatic, is not satisfactory to those upon whom the suspicion which was the foundation of that rule, could attach, immediate gain is a stronger temptation than the hope of future advantage, subject to disappointment, not only by the casualties of life, but also, where the state of the lunatic admits it, by the liberal application of his income for maintenance. The heir at law is generally made the manager or committee of the estate, it being clearly his interest, by good management, to keep it in condition, accountable however to the court of chancery, and to the non-compass himself if he recovers, or otherwise to his administrators. If the chancellor acts improperly, in granting such custodies, the complaint lies to the king in council. The statute which gave the guardianship of idiots, lands to the king, on his finding them maintenance out of the profits, extended not to copy hold lands, for the prejudice that would thereby accrue to the lord but yet all alienations made by an idiot of his copyhold lands, after office found, may be avoided by the king, and it hath been holden, that though the king cannot have the custody of an idiot or lunatic copyholder, on this account, yet the lord of a man and a community jury hath not the custody of the lunatic's lands, but there must be a special custom to warrant it. But it has been resolved that the lord shall have the custody of one mutus et sedas, without alleging any custom for otherwise he would be prejudiced in his rents and services, which reason extends as well where there is no custom as where there is, and the same reason seems to apply to a lunatic. Although the king hath the sole direction of these cases, yet a private person may confine a friend who is insane, and bind and beat him in such a manner as such unhappy cases often require. So power is given by statute to the magistrates to confine vagrants insane. 12 An, C. 23. Rep. By 13 G. 2. C. 24. And finally repealed by 17 G. 2. C. 25. But see postua, the custody of a lunatic may be granted to a theme covert, though she be not sui juris, but under power of her husband, and where it was granted to husband and wife, she being next of kin, and died, the husband's right determined, for the grant was joint 
and a mere authority without interest. 1735. A trustee under a will may continue the person of the lunatic in the same custody, as he found him in, unless he discover acts of cruelty and oppression, want of necessaries, and c. And he may retain the profits of an estate for persons to whom they were devised over in the contingency of an intermediate person being lunatic, if he prove to be so, and if any connivance be proved to keep him out of his estate, by setting up his lunacy, and he be not so, costs of suit will be ordered. A devise by will of the custody of a lunatic, niece to one who was no relation, is absolutely void, the father himself could not make such a will, though he might dispose of the guardianship of his child during minority, yet, after twenty-one years of age, he has no such power. The same person may be committee of the person and of the estate, except the heir at law, to whom the court never commits his person. In selecting the proper persons to fill these offices, the prudent caution of the court has generally been guided by the principle of uniting interest with duty, as already stated, and if there is any strong aversion, however groundless, in the disordered mind of the lunatic, against a party proposed as committee of his person, this will be regarded by the court whose endeavours are to make these unfortunate people as easy as possible. The court never grants the custody of the person to two committees, for this has been found to occasion suits and expense, but there is no objection to anyone who will have a share in the personal estate. A person named committee by the court, suffered the lunatic to dwell with the committee of his estate, who was his uncle, during thirty-two years, on a petition from one of the next of kin to remove him, and to lessen his allowance. The court refused both, declaring that the uncle, from the length of time, in which he had shown him the utmost tenderness, was the properest guardian, that the allowance contributed to his comfort, and that he had long been in that unhappy condition. Yet in the eye of the law a lunatic is never to be looked upon as desperate, but always at least in a possibility of recovering, and then the benefit and comfort to be guarded by the court, where no creditor complains, are for his benefit nor for any next of kin, all of whom he may survive. The bankruptcy of the committee of the lunatic's person is a sufficient cause for his removal from the management of the friend destined for his maintenance. But the mere custody of the person will not be changed if the master find that, for the comfort of the lunatic, it should be continued. Although it is unusual for a brother to petition to be committee, and that a receiver be appointed for the estate, on the refusal of the heir at law, who, with the brother, is the only next of kin, and not able to give the requisite security, yet the court has appointed the brother committee of person and estate, with restriction not to receive, and referred it to the master to appoint a receiver, to account and pay to the accountant general, after the necessary maintenance. This guardianship shall not be committed to any that will make gain of it, or who is concerned to outlive the lunatic, as being nearest of blood, and entitled to the administration and the allowance must be liberal and honourable for his maintenance, but there is no instance of any allowance to the committee for his trouble, and the choice of the court as to the committee of the person is generally influenced by the sex of the party, as well as by other circumstances. The next of kin and expectants are not to be considered, but the lunatic is to have every comfort which his circumstances will admit. If the lunatic be a married man, his wife must have the commitment of his person, and an allowance suitable to his estate and rank. His estate must be accounted for, and if he die without issue, a moiety goes to her as is usual. The grant to a committee does not extend to his executors or administrators, nor is it assignable. And if a wife be insane, and her husband has the care of her, the court, in making account of dividends of her separate estate, as directed against the husband, will order due consideration to be had of his extra expense of maintaining her by the custom prevalent in the province of York, before the statute of 12 car. 2. c. 24. For abolishing the court of ward and liveries, and for appointing guardians by will, and c. A tutor might be assigned to a child unborn, as also to an idiot or lunatic. But this statute gives no power to the father to appoint a guardian to his child, being an idiot or lunatic after he shall be twenty-one years of age. Therefore although the father be within that age, yet he may grant the custody of his child, but cannot demise or devise his land in trust for him directly, but he may do it obliquely, for by appointing the custody, 
the land follows as an incident given by the law to attend it, a will or appointment made solely upon this act, need not be proved in the spiritual court, for the appointment being by statute, the temporal courts shall be judges of it, and the words of such appointment may be, I commit my children to the power of A, B, or, I leave them in his hands, I leave them to his government, regimen, administration, and C. Under this appointment, the ecclesiastical court cannot intermeddle with the body. But this guardian takes place of all others, and being made after the model of a sockage guardian, and coming in place of the father, hath not a bare authority, but an interest joined with his trust is necessary to the performance of it, but not an interest for himself. He can only lease at will, and not for years, for he is himself only tenant at will. A defendant having become impaired in his mind, after the decree, a guardian was appointed for him, by whom he might produce books, and c. 1756, and where the committee was one of the plaintiffs in a suit with the lunatic, the court referred it to the master to appoint a guardian to answer and defend. The court will not appoint a master in chancery committee, t. on the score of public policy. He would probably have to pass his own accounts. Upon the fair influence that the character of one master in matters of account would have upon the mind and judgment of another master, the conclusion must be, that the appointment of them, as receivers and committees, a situation in which third persons are to enter into conflict with them never could obtain a satisfactory administration of justice. Though private persons may put them in the character of executors, the property of suitors is not by the judgment of this court to be put into the hands of its officers. The office of committee of the person is given for the sake not of the committee, but of the lunatic, and the allowance is to be given for the purpose of attaching him to the lunatic. Therefore where it appeared that the person proposed had engaged to give to another 348s of the savings of the profits. It was reason why the court would not appoint him. In the reign of Hen, 8, Drive, Pace, Dean of the Cathedral Church of Street, Paul, London, becoming a lunatic, was retained in the custody of the Archbishop of Cantor. Berry, and this was established in the Court of Wards, since abolished, upon precedence shown, in preference to the Crown. Section 2. The principle thereof. What Lord Hardwick said on a different subject well applies to the case of any trustee, and particularly to that of a committee. By accepting of a trust of this sort, a person is obliged to execute it with fidelity and reasonable disobedience. His omission of his duty is his own default, and he must bear such a proportion as is suitable to the loss arising from his particular neglect. A court of equity can lay hold of every breach of trust. Let the person be guilty of it either in a public or private capacity. The tribunals of this kingdom are wisely formed, both of courts of law and equity, and so are the tribunals of most other nations, and for this reason there can be no injury, but there must be a remedy in all or some of them. In general the court of chancery looks upon trusts as honorary, and a burden upon the honor and conscience of the person entrusted and not undertaken upon mercenary views. Hence it is that no allowance is ever made to them for their trouble, they are supposed to have regard for the lunatic and his family, and are often his relations, or at least friends, who undertake the care upon charitable and affectionate motives, and the nearer is the relationship, so much less is the ground for any such allowance. His next of kin have no power to consent, for it is the interest of the lunatic which the court regards, and though they may be next of kin at the time, yet he may outlive them, and his personal estate go at his death into other hands. But if there be great trouble in managing the estates, he may petition for an increase of maintenance, without any report from the master, which will answer the purpose, the comfort and maintenance of the lunatic, according to the limits of his income, out of which a liberal allowance is made, is the first concern of the committee, who in, this respect may be esteemed the confidential agent of the court, and the imbecility of his charge should work a principle in his mind of extraordinary fidelity in the execution of his trust. Some have considered him rather as a bailiff than a trustee, who, though entrusted with a considerable confidence, cannot injure the estate as a trustee could, who possesses the fee, and could fraudulently grant it. Still there are moral and legal obligations upon him to which he is equally bound to adhere in the fulfilment of a charge so responsible as this. For, he cannot change the nature of the estate by converting money into land, 
or land into money, he cannot apply the produce for any sinister purposes, nor even for necessary repairs without a previous order, nor extend any part of the allowance for maintenance to any of the lunatic's family or himself, in preference to the comforts suitable to his condition and former station in life, as far as his fortune will admit, but he will be allowed for maintenance of the lunatic's son, and in every transaction the interest of the lunatic is to be his primary consideration, to which all other interests in being, or in expectancy, are to yield. If any part of the estate is liable to forfeiture, or other peculiar conditions, the committee is bound to protect it against those events, and if he has not power, he is bound to apply for power to the court. He is chargeable for supine negligence, yet the proof must be very strong, if he be robbed, the loss will be allowed in his accounts, on proving it upon his own oath, for he was to keep it but as his own. The power of the committee is very limited, and therefore, when any extra step is desirable, he should make application to the court, such as that of granting leases and raising money, cutting timber, and the like. Otherwise he will be liable to the consequences of any adverse application against him for exceeding his authority, and also to the consequences of leading others into a bad title, it being a rule, which the court itself observes in its decrees, from which he is never to depart, not to vary or change the property of a lunatic so as to effect any alteration as to the succession of it. As the committee of the estate is vested only during pleasure, and has no interest, he cannot grant leases nor any ways encumber the estate without a special order of court, where the profits are insufficient for the lunatic's maintenance, and can bring an ejectment and trespass only in the lunatic's name. Colon he cannot take up more money on a mortgage than to form made by the lunatic while sane, one, nor be allowed for any improvements and buildings ordered by him the committee, and the heir will be let into them, but see contra, to ask. 414. The committee cannot present to a vacant benefice, for that right belongs to the great seal, and was asserted by Lord Talbot. M. He cannot invest any surplus of the estate in lands, even in the lunatic's name. This, though with good design, is an exceeding of his authority, and were the lunatic insolvent at his death, this surplus should be applied in discharge of his debts, and such lands, thus purchased would be liable notwithstanding the claims of the heirs at law. It is provided by the statute, that any surplus should be safely kept and delivered to him upon his recovery, or employed for his soul if he die, therefore now it belongs, in that event, to his next of kin, and any lands so purchased, would be decreed to be sold for their use. But the interest of a fund in court belonging to the husband, who was in a state of imbecility, was ordered to be paid to the wife for the maintenance of the family. 1792, and in taking the account of a wife's separate estate, she being a lunatic, regard will be had to the extra expense. Section 3. The security requisite. The court, in order to exercise due vigilance over their agent, require, from the committee or receiver of the estate, the security of two responsible persons, in double the sum at which the amount of his receipts may be computed. 9. And it is one of the duties of the Attorney General, to whom this part of the matter is referred, to see that they are proper persons, and their recognizance regularly executed and filed with the clerk of the custodies. The amount is settled upon a general state of the lunatic's property, of which an inventory is made out at the time of executing the commission, by which the Attorney General sees what the outstanding personal estate and rents of the real estate amount to, and directs the amount of the security accordingly. The persons, two or more, proposed to him as securities, must be approved by all the parties concerned, and allowed by him to execute the usual bond. If any difficulty occurs in providing this security, for though the committee proposed and allowed may be the most upright, yet his connections may not perhaps be competent to meet so large a sum, as the outstanding estate, when doubled, may require, it may be prudent to procure some of those who are indebted to the estate to pay their debts into court, on due notice to all parties. This will perhaps bring the amount within their power. It seems also reasonable that as the committee proceeds to lessen the outstanding amount, by receiving and paying it into court, or applying it as directed, he and his co-securities should be relieved as to the amount of their bonds, and on some particular circumstances the court will be induced to grant that the bond be delivered up, 
and fresh securities taken. But the trouble and expense of such applications on every occasion when the receipts are diminished, would be a charge upon the estate, not very just or equitable, and are therefore discouraged but on very particular cases. Even applications to change the security, when greater are offered, are not encouraged, for, though this may have the appearance of benefit to the estate, yet it may be of dangerous consequence, for if the bond were delivered up, and there happened to be a concealment of any part of the estate on taking the account, and the lunatic afterwards recover, he could have no remedy for that for the time past, and it is too frequent that those accounts are superficially taken, and it cannot always be otherwise. In passing his accounts the committee must state what sums he has had in his hands from time to time, and cannot keep money without being liable to interest, and if he make considerable savings, he will be liable for interest thereon, unless any particular circumstances can be shown that he did not use it, for he ought to have made interest of it, and unless he pass his accounts regularly every year, he will not be entitled to his costs. The King, or the Great Seal, cannot grant the custody of a lunatic's estate without account, but he may allow as great a salary for maintenance as the income of the estate amounted to. Where the profits were allowed generally to the committee for the maintenance, and he gave security accordingly, at the lunatic's death his next akin filed a bill for relief, but the court held that it was the same as if they had granted an allowance equal to the profits. The order was pleaded and directed to stand for an answer, and that unless gross fraud could be proved, no relief could be expected. Sheldon v. Alland. J. 1731. The right and interest in the profits, and c. of an idiot's estate has relation back to the time of the office found, not from his birth, but the office shall relate back to his birth, so as to avoid all mesnacts done by him. But of this hereafter, land being held by an idiot, subject to services, or to mortgage, any person may make the tender for him in respect of his absolute disability, and the law, in this case, is grounded upon charity, and so in like cases. If a committee cannot be procured, a receiver may be appointed, with a salary, upon giving the necessary security as a committee, and the property may continue in the original trustees, it is not material whether he is called committee or receiver. If this should become an established rule of practice, it will not be unfrequent for men to refuse to become committee, to whom no compensation for trouble is allowed, but some probable expense in extra costs, and yet use influence enough to be appointed receiver by which name they are to be allowed a salary or commission, on receiving and paying. As soon as the committee has passed his accounts, it is his duty to present a petition to the Lord Chancellor, for leave to pay into court, the balance remaining in his hands. This petition is answered as of course, and an order is drawn up thereon. Dot. All orders, as well as reports, ought to be filed with the clerk of the custodies, those upon which the accountant general is to act are drawn up by the principal register of the court, and this is procured by taking a duplicate of the order from the secretary of lunatics, one for the register, and the other for the clerk of the custodies, and the master gives a duplicate of his reports for the same purpose, one of which is filed in the report office, and the other with the clerk of the custodies. Section 4 The Duties and Power One of the principal duties of the committee of the estate, is to take care of one rule of law, that neither the property nor its succession suffer any change, but to act always under the court's direction, which has sometimes zero dollars ordered. Where a purchase was made of real estate with the money of a person two years afterwards found by inquisition to have been a lunatic at the time of the purchase, and it appeared that the finding was carried too far, by his incapacity having arisen from a distemper of apoplexy or palsy, for he should have been found incapable of managing his own affairs. Evidence was received by the court, that he lived with his own family after the paralytic disorder, as well as before, and was assisted in the management of his affairs by his only son and his steward, and at the time when the purchase was depending rode out to inspect the intended purchase, the purchase was maintained, as it appeared to have been a reasonable act. There are many instances of apoplexy turning to paralytic disorders, which may at first affect only the members and organs of the body, and, by degrees, as the weight of the distemper increases, may affect the memory and understanding. This act was done with the concurrence of his whole family, and it would be attended with numerous inconveniences, if, 
in such circumstances, the court should alter the property, he having one son, who must have been heir to the real estate, if not otherwise disposed of, and entitled to the personal if he died intestate, and the court ought especially to give the turn of the scale in in favor of the heir. c. Although the court will not order the personal estate of a lunatic to be turned into real estate, yet there have been applications for leave to lay out part of the personal in repairs and improvements, and the court has allowed it, if the next of kin, who, in case of the lunatic estate at that time would be entitled to his personal estate, do not show any reason against it, and such an order has been binding upon other persons who were not consenting to the order at the time it was made but happened to be the next of kin at the time of his death. Part of Lord Annandale's property consisted of estates in Scotland vested by Parliament in lands there, during his minority. He became lunatic, after the age of 21 years. He was found lunatic in England, but there was no process of that sort in Scotland, and his steward managed his estate there as before. It was of material importance that all his property should be equally disposed of for his maintenance, and that the savings should be fairly applied, and therefore, to effect this, it was ordered that it should be vested in the purchase of lands in a particular county in England, pursuant to his ancestor's will. The act only directed it to be laid out there, during his minority, which had expired. It was plausible enough, that the same reason arose from his insanity, but, on a very different consideration, the one might continue his whole life, the other several years, which the legislature saw would end by computation of time, the interest of the trust estate ought to overbalance, and therefore the court ordered the trustees to call it in, and the committee to sue in the lunatic's name, and the lunatic to execute a proxy, attested by the committee, as to the application for money to be raised for his maintenance and personal debts, between the produce of the two estates, the personal, in Scotland, at his death being subject to a different rule of distribution from that in England, the trust money being part of the ancestor's estate, and to be laid out in England, was to be considered in chancery as an estate in England, and the interest from thence, though arising out of an estate in Scotland, yet, as it was a mere transitory thing arising on changeable securities, which might and ought to be called in, and was directed by the will to go as the profits of the land when purchased taught was necessarily considered as part of his personal estate in England, to be so applied. Any other personal property he had in Scotland was considered as personal property there. A proportion of maintenance and debts between the two estates, was therefore ordered. £3,200 produce of inheritable estate in Scotland, charged with encumbrances, sold under the act above mentioned, was remitted to England. The act did not dictate how it should be applied, leaving that to the Court of Session of Scotland, had they found him lunatic. It was therefore ordered to be considered as part of his real estate in Scotland, subject to all the encumbrances, and to be applied in discharging them. In Grimstone's case, 1772, the custody of the estate had been granted to the heir at law, and a receiver had been appointed. Mortgages paid out of the savings were directed to be assigned to attend the inheritance. Upon the lunatic's death, the next of kin partitioned for the personal estate, and to have the mortgages considered as personal. The court declared the trustee, to whom the terms had been assigned, to be deemed a trustee for the next of kin, to the extent of the mortgage and interest, and an account to be taken. Two points arose. 1. Whether the order was right. 2. If wrong, that the great seal had no jurisdiction to vary it. Dot. As to 1, in the management of a lunatic s estate. The ruling principle is to do what is for the benefit of the lunatic to lay it down as a rule, that all the savings out of the real estate shall, in all cases, go to the next of kin, is inverting the principle, the court every day orders the savings to be laid out in repairs, and to discharge encumbrances on the real estate. The case of an infant differs from that of a lunatic, because he can dispose of personal sooner than he can of real estate, and yet, in many cases, the court will order money of an infant, to be laid out in discharging encumbrances, and even in keeping up houses and gardens. It is frequent to order repairs out of rents and profits. If the mortgagee should enter, the rents and profits will be applied to the principal as well as to the interest, and therefore why should not the court order this application? Lord McClesfield, in Dormer's case, ordered 2001.
per annum to be applied to keep down debts, rents and profits are the fruits of the real estate, they differ very much from other personal estate, and it would be too hard upon the heir to impoverish the rent for the benefit of the personal estate. The case of an infant is different, for an infant has a personal interest to increase the personal fund, which is sooner subject to his disposition than the real estate, and yet even in the case of infants the court will order repairs out of the rents and profits. The first order was established, too. As to the jurisdiction, whether the court could vary a former order, it was said, that acting in matters of lunacy under a special authority, the Chancellor had no power over the estate, except by the bond taken from the committee, and when the lunatic is dead and the bond given up, the proceedings must be by bill in Chancery. When a person is found a lunatic, the King alone can grant the custody of him by sign manual, and therefore to save repeated applications, there is always a sign manual to the Chancellor on coming into office. This warrant is a special authority to make the grant, but extends no farther, and the grant being made, the Chancellor then acts, not under their warrant, but as keeper of the King's conscience in the exercise of this branch of prerogative. If the warrant was granted to any officer of state, it would not enable that officer to act after the grant made, but merely to direct the grant, all appeals, and every exercise of prerogative, must be to the king in council. Neither reason nor precedent warrant the position, that the jurisdiction ceases with the death of the lunatic, as in 3 Atk. 308. It is a principle not only as to lunatics but infants, that no part of their property during their incapacity, can be changed to the prejudice of the successor. It would not only be of prejudice to legal representatives, but in case of a will made before the lunacy, which is not revoked thereby, if the personal estate should, during the lunacy, be diminished, the legatees and even the creditors might suffer. See the preceding case of Lord Annandale, also Digg's case, 4 Brown 236. N. Where the fine and charges of renewal of a freehold church lease for three lives, was paid by the committee and allowed in his account of the personal estate by order, and the interest in the new lease ordered to be personal estate if he should die in his lunacy, where the court had thought fit to order at the instigation of the next of kin and committee to cut timber, the produce was invested in the funds, and the question was, whether it was real or personal. The heir at law claimed this produce by the same right as if the timber had been standing, as in Grimstone's case, and Tullet's case and were cut by order of court, this claim was substantiated by Lord Hardwick, in Lord Annandale's case, in Bedden's case, Lord Ipsley, 1771, ordered the produce to satisfy specialty debts, where timber is cut without order, the property never changes, if cut by order, there is no reason for changing it on that account, unless a special order be made on circumstances, and all the cases do not show what was done with the produce. For the next of kin it was contended, that wherever it had been done by order, the produce had gone to the personal estate, but admitted that the court can by decree change the property, where it would be for the benefit of the lunatic. In the cases of Grimstone, Clark, and Shelley, the produce of timber went to the next of kin, by order, or in the residue. In reply, no case decreed that the produce does not continue in the nature of timber. The lands by the statute are to be kept without waste, and in no wise to be aliened. The committee is a mere bailiff, and by two vern. 92. Personal laid out in land is to be considered personal, and go to the next of kin, in case of intestacy, and to execute as if a will were made during sanity. It is different respecting infants and lunatics, as to infants. The crown is the general guardian, but with respect to lunatics, it is a special authority, the case of the lunatic is therefore stronger than that of an infant, against altering the nature of the estate. Lord Thurlow according to the argument, the court can on no account apply the timber to the personal use of the lunatic, so that it cannot apply it to the payment of debts, or even to preserve him from a jail and this because the statute has said that their lands shall be kept without waste or destruction, and shall in no wise be aliened. It is said that a lunatic is reduced to the situation of a tenant for life. I cannot assimilate in my mind, the situation of a lunatic with a mere tenant for life, the statute must be construed to mean that the lands shall be kept without destruction, in the same manner as the owner of them would keep them if he were of sound mind, 
If this be the true construction of the statute, I cannot distinguish between the case of a lunatic and an infant. It is extremely clear, that at the death of the lunatic, this money was part of his personal property, it would have been considered as such upon a plea of Plenadminis Travis, it would have been so for the purpose of paying his debts, it seems difficult to say how the heir at law can claim it against his personal representative, I doubt whether he can have any equity to recall it out of his hands, he cannot do so on any ground but upon some equity arising from its having been improperly converted into personality and probably if a committee had wantonly and of his own head so converted it, the court might have thought that such a fraudulent management and breach of confidence reposed in him, of the lunatic's property, as to raise an equity for the heir at law, where a strange cut timber of a lunatic, the court thought, as there was no breach of confidence, it was like the case of a windfall and that no equity arose to the heir at law. I think it impossible to say that where the court has, for good and substantial reasons, thought proper to change the nature of the property, I have no conception that in such a case any equity can arise to the heir at law. It is perfectly indifferent which way it falls, and therefore he can have no equity to recall it from the personal representative. The court have thought proper to change the property, and they have done so on reasons which exclude all hardships from the case of the heir, at the same time, I think that the court ought to act with great care, and only in urgent occasions, left undecided, the register's note is, that the timber having been cut down by order of court, and for convenience of the lunatic, it was severed and became personal estate, and dismissed the petition, recommending a bill, the question here left undecided was afterwards, in 1793, more fully argued, upon a bill filed after the death of the lunatic, by his heir at law, Sir Henry Oxenden, against Lord Compton, his personal representatives, on which Lord Chancellor Loughborough gave judgment in favour of the next of kin, that the produce of timber, felled on a lunatic's estate by the committee under an order of court, is personal estate. The question of changing the property was fully considered in the judgment then given for a new trial 9 there being no equity. 1793 The committee may exercise the same power in regard to cutting timber for repairs, as any discreet person who was the owner of it might do, and therefore, where money had been laid out from the personal estate in the purchase of timber to repair barns on the real estate, it was ordered to be made good, for it appeared that this had been done merely with regard to the committee's own interest in the reversion, while there was on the estate timber proper for the purpose. If timber be cut on the lunatic's estate, whether by order of court or by the committee, and afterwards approved by the court, the rule has been not to change the property if any surplus remain, but to pay it to the heir at law. The principle of all the cases is, that where the property of the lunatic is concerned, the court will not permit a wanton change of the circumstances of that property to change the rights of his representatives after his death, but the court will support the committee in doing it, where it is manifestly for the lunatic's benefit. The general rule is, that the estate of the lunatic is not to be altered, with this qualification, that, that rule must be properly understood that the real principle in managing a lunatic's estate is to do what is for his benefit, that if in all cases, all the savings of the real should go to the next of kin, it would invert the principle that the court every day lays down, that those savings should be invested in repairs, and in discharging encumbrances on the real estate, and if it were necessary to increase his allowance, the court would cut down timber not decaying, if it would render his state more comfortable. The statute to prerogative regis directs that the property shall be kept without waste and the residue beyond maintenance shall be kept for the use of the lunatic, and be delivered to him when of right mind, so that it shall in no wise be aliened, and see. It is not possible to assimilate the case of a lunatic, tenant in fee, to that of tenant for life, impeachable for waste, for the latter has no property in the timber at all, and therefore, waste by him, has a different construction from that waste mentioned in this statute, which only means without destruction, and does not hinder the committee, under the authority of the king, from making use of those opportunities which the property of the lunatic would enable him, if in possession of his senses, to make use of, to deliver himself personally from any pressing urgency. It is said in Grimstone's case, that the court has more power over the personal, than the real property of lunatics, 
and that the authority of the court does not go to touch any part of the inheritance, or to diminish it, because it is to be kept without waste or alienation. It is clear in estimation of law, that at the death of the lunatic this money is part of his personal property, where a committee, or guardian, has abused his trust, with a view of changing the quality of the estate, to serve his own interest, there arises an equity to undo the tortious act, but there is no rule of equity upon a less ground than that. Perhaps the court, where guardians or committees have, without order, taken upon themselves to change the property, will, particularly where there is a cause in court, consider it as a matter of fraudulent management, for that is the ground upon which the court must proceed. If it be cut down tortiously, it would be like the case of windfalls, and ought not to be restored by equity. Considering it so, it is impossible where the court, taking those precautions it always does, and ought to take, not to do it idly or unnecessarily, but for the benefit of the lunatic or infant, thinks proper to cut timber, and convert it, to conceive an equity to change the condition of dot that when become personal, and to replace it for the heir, for it is truly said, that being done for the benefit of the infant, it becomes indifferent whether it is for the benefit of the heir, or personal representative afterwards, and it cannot be recalled in either case, and as the cases are quoted, particularly that before Lord Bathurst, they have gone upon that idea, that where it is found to contribute to the interest of the party to make the change, that has been thought such a good reason for it, as to exclude all considerations of hardship or an equity between representatives. Lord Thurlow. The same doctrine was recognized in the following year, and as the reasoning was equally important, I cannot refrain inserting it also at length. There is no equity between real and personal representatives, each must take what they find at the decease of the person entitled for life, in the condition in which they find it. The heir at law cannot be entitled to the produce of decaying timber against the personal representative, for in that case he would receive a profit he never would have received, if the estate had continued untouched. Besides, that in all probability he is, as possessor of the real, in possession of a benefit, in consequence of cutting the timber, by the improvement made thereby in what was left, for it might be annually deteriorating, and the growing timber lessening in value, so that the estate, but for this, would have been in a much worse condition and the value of the timber would have been annihilated. The stat. De Pro Regis does not commit the care of a lunatic's estate to the court of chancery, but to the crown, it is not introductive of any new right of the crown, the better opinion inclines that way, and the words of the statute put it past all doubt, its object was to regulate and define the prerogative, and to restrain the abuse of treating the estates of lunatics as the estates of idiots. The words waste and destruction are to be understood in the ordinary, not in the technical sense of waste, there are cases in which to cut timber upon the estate of a lunatic would be no waste, where it makes part of the rental, not merely where it is necessary for his sustenance, but if it is part of the general rental, there is no doubt that it is the duty of the administrator to continue the usual management of the estate, and that which is suited to its circumstances, where there are valuable woods of full-grown timber fit for the navy, part of which the owner had been accustomed to cut, it would be a breach of duty in those who would have the administration of it, in case of lunacy, not to manage it in the same manner in which it had been managed before, and as he would have managed it himself, if capable. Thus the case of lunacy differs from that of a tenant for life, where this could not be done in any ordinary course of disposition. The course of the statute has been, that the king has committed this care to a certain great officer of the crown, not of necessity the person who has custody of the great seal, though it generally attends him, by warrant under the sign manual, which confers no jurisdiction, but only a power of administration, from whom an appeal lies to the king in council. The general object of attention of the managers, is solely the interest of the lunatic himself, and with regard to the management of the estate, solely the interest of the owner without looking to the interests of those who, upon his death, may have eventual rights of succession, and nothing could be more dangerous or mischievous than for him to consider how it would affect the successors. There will always be an emulation of each other, and their speculations, if the administrator was to engage in them, would mislead his attention, and confine his observation as to the interest of the only person he is bound to take care of.
the next of kin would contend for a short allowance, the heir would have no interest to contend for a small allowance out of the rents and profits, but might have an emulation against the next of kin, and therefore when the next of kin would contend for a small allowance, the heir would insist on a large one, therefore the court have always shut out of their view all consideration of eventful interests, and considered only the immediate interest of the person under their care, there would else be a constant running account between the personal and real estate. There are many cases wherein it is necessary to apply personal to purposes relating to real estate, as in repairs, and see if it were necessary for the real to bring an action of trespass, which might run into great expense, if that was not to be paid out of the personal, a great injury might be sustained, and there is no instance of a charge in a receiver's accounts of what has been expended upon one estate, in order to charge it for the other. If the Chancellor was constantly looking to the right and left, and weighing the probable interests of the representatives, the interest of the lunatic would be committed in favor of those who have no immediate interest, and whose contingent interests are left to the ordinary course of events, therefore he is to administer the estate tanquambo has pater familius, making any advantage fairly to increase and improve it, without engaging in risks and dangerous adventures, for those are not fit enterprises, but whatever tends towards ordinary improvement, it is strictly the duty of the administrator to do, considering only the immediate interest of the proprietor of the estate, but care must be taken that nothing extraordinary is to be attempted, or estate to be bought or interests to be disposed of. Any alteration of property is as far as possible to be avoided, consistently with the idea of preserving the interest of the proprietor, payment of debts is so much for his interest, and such pressing cases might be put that the Chancellor would order the application of personal to any extent, as in Grimstone's case. Thus it may be for the advantage of the estate, and of the lunatic, to fell timber. The real estate is not detrimented, but ameliorated, and the fund of the personal is increased by something arising out of the real estate, the fair fruit of the real come to maturity, which if not then gathered would be lost. It was said upon the reasoning in Beverly's case, that the power of a committee is like the power of a bailiff, suppose it cannot be raised higher, if a bailiff had cut timber without any authority, which would be very wrong conduct in a bailiff, and before it was converted into money the party die, there could be no doubt it would be personal assets, the heir could have no action against the personal representative, and though the bailiff might be answerable for his misconduct, there is no equity between the representatives upon the subject, but the court alters the property if the interest of the lunatic requires it. Money may be laid out in improvements, in draining, enclosures, renewals attending landed estates, fines of copyholds, for non-payment of which the estate would be forfeited, mortgage debts of the ancestor, or of the lunatic, are to be discharged without distinction. In all these cases the court makes an election for the lunatic, as he would have done if in his senses. Thus the rule is settled that the benefit of the lunatic only is to be considered, not that of representatives, but that what is done with that view must be done with great temper, and not if uncalled for, that must be the qualification, and that neither party can have any foundation of equity to call upon the other to account for what the other has received. The subject of reference in the case of the Marquis of Annandale, 1751, before Lord Hardwick, was, not whether it would be for the benefit of the lunatic, but of the trust estate, to call in personal property from Scotland. The interest of the lunatic was then almost a nullity, because, either way, it paid for his maintenance, but the interest which moved, was the difficulty it would be attended with to the successor, and in the result of the case it was clear that Lord Hardwick's determination took a line, to do that which ought to be done with regard to his situation as a lunatic without any regard to the contingent interests of those who probably would some time or other be his representatives. On the same principle it is determined both at law and in equity, that where there is a confusion of rights, a debtor and creditor in the same person, there is an immediate merger, but it is true in equity, though there may be that, which, if all was reduced to a legal right, would of necessity operate as a merger, a court of equity acting upon the trust, will on the intent express or implied, preserve them distinct, and that confusion of rights will not take place, as in case of infants entitled to an estate, and to a charge upon it. The rights remain distinct, 
because more beneficial, but, in cases of lunacy, the representative must take his interest as fortune has directed it, and has no equity to vary it, therefore if a lunatic die entitled to an estate, and also to a charge upon it, it is merged, and the heir takes the estate discharged, a trust term having been raised to secure charge, does not alter the matter, for that remains inert, for the trustees have no discretion, unless required to act for the purposes of the trust. By marriage settlement a sum was to be raised for younger children, and a further sum for them out of a further estate to be purchased, the testator died, leaving a son and daughter, the son became lunatic, and the daughter never received either sum, though the estate was purchased, the daughter died unmarried and intestate, leaving the lunatic her brother, and only next of kin, the lunatic died, and his next of kin and heirs were the same persons, held, this became a charge upon the lunatic's estate falling into him as representative of his sister, where, there is an union of rights, neither of them can be executed at law, but the court of chancery will preserve them distinct, if the intention so to do is either expressed or implied, between an absolute, merial and personal representative, no equity can arise. The bill filed by the representatives of the lunatic and the sister against the committee was dismissed as to both sums. So a bill was filed by a son, to set aside a settlement made by his father, a lunatic. The court refused to let the house be demised, or the furniture to be sold, and the produce brought into court, as the plaintiff did not consent. Coleman Y. Croker. If a legacy be given to put a person into holy orders, and he become lunatic, it may be applied by the committee for his benefit in some other way, as in cases of infants. Coal being found upon the estate, which was charged with mortgage debts, the committee was allowed to work the coal, the next of kin had an interest, the heir at law had no interest, it was deemed like cutting timber. The general rule is, as to application of the property, the committee will not be allowed for any monies expended, without previous order of court, in repairs or improvements, Though this rule was once relaxed, in a case which appeared fair and reasonable, and lately, 1805, where the next of kin undertook to take a part of it upon themselves, the Lord Chancellor cannot upon petition order part of the real estate to be sold for the payment of debts, in order to prevent the creditors filing a bill, ex parte Smith, nor can he make a title by an order to sell leasehold estate for the same purpose, for he cannot make lease absolute but only during the lunacy. Lord Thurlow refused this for fourteen years together, for the tenant may be ejected by the lunatic if he recover, but he can order the application of personal estate to pay debts, as far as it will go, with rents of the leasehold estate. He cannot direct creditors to take the leasehold estate in execution, but if they will, he cannot restrain them. There is no instance of putting the lunatic in a state of absolute want. The committee may bring an ejectment, but it must be in the lunatic's name, for the committee being only as bailiff, he cannot make leases of land, or take up money on mortgage, and where in the service of the declaration, the tenant being a lunatic, and living with C, who transacted all his business, and would not admit access to him, upon an affidavit of this fact, and of having delivered it to C, the court made a rule for the lunatic and C to show cause why that should not be good service and that service of the rule on C should be good also. The committee cannot grant copyhold estates, but he himself may do so by his steward, the reason is that the committee has no estate in himself.